You're watching an interview with the Oxford Political Review. I'm Nicholas Lear, the Managing Editor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by David Gork, the former Conservative Member of Parliament for South West Hertfordshire, the former UK Lord Chancellor, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and the holder of numerous ministerial positions, including Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, David, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, pleasure. I wanted to first ask you about uh, what's been going on in the last few months with respect to the commitments made by the Treasury uh, to alleviate the economic pressure of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Rishi Sunak, a government figure who has almost bucked the trend in his increasing popularity, has rolled out uh, significant spending commitments, um, cuts to VAT, so-called stamp duty holidays. Is all this sustainable? I don't think it's sustainable in the long term, but that's not to say that it's not the right thing to do in the short term. Uh, we're going, going through exceptional circumstances. I think it's justified to have exceptional measures to try to reduce as far as possible the amount of scarring in the economy. So as we come through this, and obviously the hope at the beginning of this was that it would be a relatively short period of time, um, as we come through this, the less damage that has been inflicted in the short term, the more likely it is that we can just sort of pick things up and carry on from where we left off pre-COVID. Now, obviously, this is going on for some time, uh, and that makes it harder, and it means that you can't carry on those short-term measures for a long period of time. And again, I think the Chancellor is right in terms of wanting to bring the furloughing scheme to an end, so that's been the biggest single measure. But in terms of the intentions behind it, in terms of the implementation of it, uh, I think yeah, that, that has gone pretty smoothly. But what we are now going to have to do is adapt to the new set of circumstances, and that requires new measures. Um, but yes, you know, to answer your question, not sustainable, but these were exceptional circumstances. Uh, and I think uh, a, a strong and sensible response. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there the end of the furloughing scheme in October. Uh, how important does that make the autumn budget for Rishi Sunak and, and what do you expect to be in that budget? I think it's, it's a vital uh, moment, the autumn budget. It, it's very challenging because it's got a number of tasks it's going to need to uh, achieve, it's going to have to address. So I suspect we'll continue to need to provide uh, short-term support in a different way, short-term support that enables the economy, the jobs market to adjust to the new circumstances that we're in. Um, so you'll have that, and that might involve some degree of, of fiscal stimulus. Um, but also, I think by the time we get to the autumn, um, I think it will be necessary for the government to give a clear indication as to how it's going to put the public finances on a sustainable footing once we're through. Now, that doesn't mean that they need to be announcing and implementing tax increases, for example. But I do think they need to be setting out where they're going to do, where they're going to go. So I think they probably will need to set out um, tax increases that will be implemented at a later stage in the Parliament, once we're at a different stage of uh, the economic recovery, because that, I think, will then provide some reassurance to the financial markets. I think it will also give an indication to businesses, in particular, which taxes are going to increase increase and which ones aren't so that you've got a bit greater business certainty because I think businesses increasingly recognize that taxes are going to come up the question is they are going to go up the question is which taxes are they going to be so I think um, I think he's got that task in terms of the medium to long term where he needs to set out a strategy to get us back on a sustainable footing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the potential for tax increases I think many people would agree that they're almost a certainty given the uh, economic measures that have been rolled out. Uh, is the challenge, the political challenge to tax increases surmountable? Uh, I mean, I think recent research by UK in a changing Europe suggested that Conservative MPs are much more economically conservative uh, than Conservative voters. Will Conservative MPs come to the reality that tax increases is what's needed to get us out of the uh, recovery? It's not certain. Um, and there is a tension, I think, in, in the views that probably a lot of Conservative MPs hold, which is both 
wanting low taxes, but also wanting um, fiscal responsibility. Uh, and I think um, you know, somehow the, the Chancellor in particular has got to win this argument that you know, much in the same way in 1981, uh, Geoffrey Howe as Chancellor of the Exchequer had to put up taxes because what mattered most was sound public finances. Um, you know, we are in that situation. I stress I'm not talking about tax increases that come into effect this year or even next year or possibly even the year after that. But ultimately, um, you know, we are going to be faced. And, and again, we're not talking about the short term debt that has accumulated uh, as a response to this crisis. It is about the uh the year-on-year -year recurrent levels of borrowing which at the end of this crisis are likely to be pretty high um the economy will have taken some sort of hit which will have a long-term impact on tax receipts uh, and pressure on spending will have gone up and i don't see there being much scope to find sufficient savings elsewhere in uh the uh, in, in public spending uh, that would mean that we can uh, get away from the need to increase those taxes. But as I say, those are, those are taxes that don't think need to go up for some years yet, but I think there needs to be a plan as to what they will be. Mm -hmm. This is certainly about the long term, and I, I have some figures with which you'll be familiar, I'm sure, that the UK economy is on course to, to shrink, according to the Office of Budget Responsibility, by 12.4% this year. And, borrow 372 billion pounds, I think a peacetime high. There's also a suggestion that the debt to GDP ratio could increase by up to 400% uh, in 50 years time. Does this mean that we're in the perpetual age of austerity? Well, it, it means that there are some tough decisions to be had. Um, I mean, remember this is also a period of time where the projections are that you know, living standards will increase very substantially over that long period. But at the moment, we face um, the short-term issue of, of, of COVID. But as we look further ahead, and as the Office of Budget Responsibility has made very clear, you know, we also face um, uh, you know, difficulties anyway. I think you know, spending pressures were uh, pretty strong. Um, and then by the time we get to the 2030s, we start to face some very, very significant demographic headwinds. Um, as the baby boomer generation not only retires but reaches the age where they're likely to require uh, a lot of um, health and social care uh, and that is expensive and as our expectations uh, as ever are increasing as to what sort of health care and social care support we get um, you know those bills have to be paid for and, and I think we have to face up to that and have a long-term strategy to ensure that we don't you know, forever end up with uh, higher borrowing. Now, we, you know, we are at a period of time where interest rates are low, so the debt servicing costs are not particularly high, um, but that can change. And we are in a pretty fragile state in the event of another downturn. You know, as others have made the point in, in the course of 12 years, we've had two once in a lifetime uh, circumstances with the global financial crisis uh, and now COVID-19. Who is to say that within 12 years there won't be something else that has a significant impact on the public finances? And you know, I, I think the idea that one could just perpetually just keep borrowing, 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 seeing debt rise mm. um, places uh, unfair risks and burdens on future generations. Uh, and you know, in the end, we are going to have to get to grips with this. Yeah, I mean, on, on a further set of long-term economic consequences, um, the elephant in the room, of course, is also Brexit, which um, has largely been uh, overlooked during the crisis, and understandably, priorities have been on the immediate uh, response to the COVID-19. Um, we are now beyond the point where we can extend the transition period uh, beyond the 31st of December this year, but there is talk of some international agreement beyond EU law that could be made, that seems unlikely. Uh, under the assumption that we are going to, uh, the transition period is going to come to an end this year, and looking at the state of negotiations, what sort of long-term relationship, uh, if any, do you see coming out of these negotiations? 
I'm pretty pessimistic. Um, I think if there is a deal that is going to be reached, it's going to be pretty thin. Um, so I don't think it will give us particularly good access to EU markets. I think that will have um, significant disruption. Um, and I think perhaps, perhaps more importantly, in the longer term, that makes the UK a less attractive place in which to invest. You've got choices as to where you want to invest uh, to get access to European markets. Obviously, the UK is at a disadvantage. So I, I think um, any deal that we get is, is going to be pretty thin. Uh, and I think there is a distinct risk that, in fact, we won't reach a deal. Uh, in the course of this year, and that we will leave the transition period at the end of December uh, without a comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, and that, I think, will be bad news for a number of businesses. But I, you know, I just think that, um, you know, in, in a way, given that there is relatively little to be gained economically by, a, by the deal that we have boxed ourselves into um, achieving as our maximum uh, objective, uh, I, I wonder to what extent the, you know, the government will, will absolutely hold on to some positions that make it very, very hard for the EU uh, to reach a deal, particularly on this issue of the level playing field provisions. Um, so I think, I think the risk of, of no deal is, is, is pretty high. I think the government will be prepared to, to leave without a deal. Uh, and I think the EU will be prepared uh, to refuse a deal unless they are reassured that um, we are not going to be uh, providing what they consider to be unfair competition, undercutting the European Union on issues like social regulation, environmental regulation, and uh, state aid provisions. So I, I, you know, I, I'm certainly not saying a deal is in, impossible. My yeah. current estimate is probably si sort of 60% chance of no deal and 40% chance of a thin deal. That's, I think, at the sort of pessimistic end. For you know, I think most commentators are probably a bit more optimistic than that. But I think that's pretty broadly where I am. Well, I mean, to take you back to Theresa May's withdrawal agreement, which you were a supporter of, of course, um, she was notorious for imposing her red lines at the start of negotiations. Um, but do you think that the EU bears any responsibility for uh, a failure to agree a deal with Theresa May that she could sell uh, to the UK Parliament? I think there are areas where the European Union were uh, pretty inflexible uh, and they could have gone further. Uh, but I think what the message that I think a lot of us were getting uh, from the EU is, you know, why should we make further concessions to you, Theresa May, because we don't think, even if we give you those concessions, that you can get them through the House of Commons. And that was the sort of fundamental problem that she faced, was that uh, because you know, a significant number of her own party were sort of pretty well determined to vote down any deal that she brought back, uh, the EU, you know, sometimes say, well, you know, that's what forced the EU into making concessions. Actually, it had the reverse impact. The EU weren't prepared to show more flexibility because they thought it would be a waste. They would be making concessions and w which would they considered in, in themselves not to be in their interests. Um, but, but if it was to deliver a deal, then it might have been worthwhile. But as far as they can see, it wasn't going to deliver a deal anyway. Um, so yes, the you know, the EU could have moved further, but you know, was that the fundamental reason why uh, she wasn't able to get her deal through? No, it wasn't. You had you know part of the House of Commons that essentially was pretty determined to reject any deal that she had because that's what you know opposition MPs do, uh, and you know large numbers felt that any exit from the European Union was 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 a bad thing. Um, and then you had others who were essentially of the view that you know, any credible, you know, any any viable deal was um, going to be a step too far, was, was not going to deliver all the freedoms and flexibility that they believe Brexit should deliver. Uh, and they were therefore going to vote against any kind of deal. And that was the impossible position that she was in. Uh, and, you know, in truth, once she'd lost that, 
conservative majority in the 2017 general election. Mm. Um, certainly with the benefit of hindsight, you know, it all looked pretty inevitable that you know, nothing, nothing good was going to come of it. Mm. Uh, and of course, after Theresa May, we had the, uh, uh, the start of Johnson's first ministry and um, you were, um, along with 20 other Conservative MPs, uh, removed from the Parliamentary Party. You had the whip withdrawn uh, for your act of rebellion against Johnson's attempt to, I suppose, have a contingency plan to leave without a deal. Um, do you ever regret that decision or do you think perhaps that you're all on the wrong side of history, particularly given that Johnson was able then to reopen uh, Theresa May's withdrawal agreement? Uh, I mean, at one level, uh, I regret it in the sense of, you know, would I rather um, have continued as a member of parliament for South West Hertfordshire, continued as a member of the Parliamentary Conservative Party? Uh, you know, at one level, yes, of course, I would have done. You know, it was a job I, I, I you know, I adored. Um, and, you know, I'm very sorry to, to give that up. But at another level, I think it was the right thing to do, and even with the benefit of hindsight. Um, it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, Boris Johnson got a deal by essentially moving his position on Northern Ireland. One could say, you know, frankly, sort of selling out Northern Ireland in terms of uh, creating a border in the Irish Sea, something he said he, he wouldn't do. But that was one of the ways in which a deal could be reached. Uh, and I don't believe that he would have made that concession uh, had it not been for the fact that Parliament had essentially prevented him from crashing out without a deal on the 31st of October. Had we not intervened in the way that we had, I think he would have taken us out of the EU on the 31st of October, come hell or high water, um, and, um, and I think we'd have faced very, very difficult circumstances then. Um, so I, I believe that what you yeah, believed at the time, and I believe now, it was the right thing to do to prevent that from happening. What I fear, however, is you know the, the intention was to prevent us leaving without a deal, uh, and and I do worry that you know our actions has, have merely delayed uh, the point at which we leave without a deal. With one very important caveat that, of course. Uh, Northern Ireland um, you know, is not leaving the EU without a deal. There is a deal that applies to Northern Ireland. It does mean that we're not returning a hard border on the island of Ireland with all the security risks that that would involve. But uh, no, I think, um, you know, as sort of looking back on it, um, you know, it was an intervention that meant that there was at least uh, a deal for the first stage of our departure from the European Union, uh, but the general election result has meant that there is a distinct risk that there won't be a deal for the second stage. Mm. I mean, it was, as you say, it was around October last year when uh, Johnson realised that he wasn't going to be able to get the numbers in Parliament that he needed uh, to, to secure what he wanted. Uh, and it was around that time when the Russia report was due to be released by the chair then of the Intelligence and Security Committee, Dominic Grieve. Um, we know today, of course, that that report has been uh, released um, and it includes information about Russian activity um, across the UK since 2014, including electoral interference uh, in the Scottish and EU referenda. Um, and it makes it clear the report that the UK has been one of uh, Russia's primary Western intelligence uh, targets for several years. The UK seemed to know about this, but nothing was done. You were a part of David Cameron and Theresa May's government. Uh, why was this not a priority for government? I think it's a fair question. I've not had an opportunity to look closely at the report itself. Um, I, I, I think the report should, should certainly have been published um, and, and should have been published before the last general election. I think it was a great pity that that didn't happen. It was information that should have been put in front of the electorate. Uh, I, I suspect that um, you know, the criticism is that there wasn't a curiosity to find out what involvement Russia had had in terms of its influence over the referendum in 2016. Uh, and I suspect that's a, that's a fair criticism. Uh, I, I would say, I think you know, some of the concerns that 
they, it was Russia that made all the difference, that that um, you know, swung the result, and but for that intervention, the country would have voted to remain. I, I don't, I'm not convinced by that argument um, by any means. Um, but the criticism of you know looking back should should there have uh, should there have been you know, closer a closer look at this at the time, I think that's probably fair enough. But let let's not you know kid ourselves that you know, there was such a close look would have you know, come up with an answer that invalidated the result of the 2016 referendum. At one level, I wish that it would have done, but um, um, but I, d I don't think that that was ever realistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, were it not for last week, the election of Julian Lewis, this report might not have been published. In fact, we know that number 10 had a favoured candidate, Chris Grayling. Um, and of course, Julian, like yourself, had the whip withdrawn um, when putting himself forward for chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Um, the statute that creates the committee prohibits this sort of partisan behaviour. What does it tell us about the workings of number 10 at the moment? I, I worry about that. I thought it was um, it was wrong for the government to seek to influence the appointment of the of the chair of this particular select committee because, as you say, the statute is clear that this is a matter for the for the members of the committee. Um, I, I don't know quite what communications were uh, took place between uh, Julian and the Whips office, but. Um, I've not always agreed with Julian Lewis, but it has struck me as a very honourable person if he said that you know, he never he never made assurances that he was going to support Chris Grayling. Uh, I have absolutely no reason to doubt that. Um, I think you know, this has been a matter that has been badly mishandled. Uh, my sense is that the, the whips were sort of lashing out. Um, and it's an extraordinary... Uh, reaction to withdraw the whip away from somebody who has not even rebelled on a whipped vote. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's, and, and particularly if uh, you know, it's, it, he has not um, uh, lied to the whips, which is a serious matter, but you know, he appears not to have lied to the whips. Um, I, I, I think it is very odd and strange behaviour, and I think it is important that we have strong institutions in this country um, and not, you know, not all power is in the hands of, of, of number 10, the Prime Minister and his advisors. Mm -hmm. you know, so strong institutions like Parliament, uh, like the civil service, like the judiciary, uh, like a, a free and independent press, mm -hmm. you know, these are all uh, crucial to how this country operates, to our international standing, to our historic traditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that the government will, will tread carefully and respect those institutions. They don't always do so, and uh, I, I think um, you know, I think uh, uh, Conservative MPs in particular should be stronger in defending those institutions when they are under attack. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, David. I, I think um, you wrote at one point a few weeks ago that you um, you foresee that Dominic Cummings' failure to resign, or indeed Johnson's failure to, to sack his chief advisor, would later hurt the government. Uh, why is Dominic Cummings so seemingly indispensable to Boris Johnson? Well, I think he's he's got a I think he's got a very good uh, strategic mind in terms of. Yeah, understanding where the electorate are. Uh, he has been um, very successful in terms of delivering the referendum results. You know, it was his strategy that, that prevailed. Um, he was very successful in delivering an 80 seat majority for, for Boris Johnson uh, last year. Again, it was his strategy that prevailed. Um, I think he does have a clear view of, of, of you know, what he wants to do in government, uh, perhaps you know, providing a vision to the Prime Minister who might not have quite such well-developed views himself. And uh, I, I think you know, to, to a large extent he you know, provides to the Prime Minister um, the vision, the drive, the energy uh, to, to get a lot of things done. He provides him with a plan from which to operate. 
Uh, and, you know, I was quite struck by the remarks of Danny Kruger, who is now a Conservative MP, had previously been a uh, political secretary to Prime Minister. You know, he wrote a letter to MPs telling them to kind of back Dominic Cummings. It's, mm. it's, that it, it's only through uh, the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings together that we can get Brexit done, level up this country and therefore go on to win the next general election. So, you know, within the non number 10 operation, there's clearly a view that, you know, without Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson is, is missing quite a lot. Yeah, and it was this week last year, in fact, where Boris became, of course, he was elected uh, leader of the Conservative Party and, and became Prime Minister then. Um, immediately, I believe, on the 24th of July, you resigned uh, from your position in government. Uh, at what point did you realise that you were not prepared to work in a Boris-run government? Uh, I, that was, it was always obvious to me. I don't think there was ever a particular, particular moment. Um, but uh, yeah, given the given the position that he had uh, taken on 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 Brexit, I mean, in truth, had he had he won uh, uh, the leadership in 2016, immediately after the referendum, I, I was minded that I would leave the front bench at that point. Anyway, that I, I wouldn't wouldn't have served under his government then. Uh, and you know, given that all that transpired from between 2016 and 2019 in terms of uh, Boris Johnson's uh, position on Brexit, uh, his, um, his uh, performance as, as, as Foreign Secretary, uh, uh, his position on the Chequers deal and his resignation, uh, and then the position he took in terms of the, 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 the Prime Minister's um, deal, the, sorry, Theresa May's deal. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not in truth about his personality as such, but I think um, in terms of uh, our positions were so far apart, I, I, I couldn't in truth see a way that mm. I could have served uh, under him. And I've no doubt that uh, he couldn't have seen a way that I could have served under him either. And you, you I think, would argue that uh, Johnson's had a, a far-reaching impact on uh, the Conservative Party. In a, in a recent article, you, you said that Conservative Party is no longer a place for small state free marketeers and one nation social liberals. Um, is this because the broad church has narrowed recently or has there been a, a voter re-coalition uh, of, of recent months? Yeah, I think it's fundamentally to do with a realignment of, um, of, of British politics, if you like. I think we are living through something as, as profound as that. Um, I think if you, if you look at... Uh, the uh, key seats, if you like. If you look at where the uh, swing voters in the swing constituencies are, who and who they are, mm -hmm. uh, there's been quite a lot of research on this. Uh, some work done by uh, Professor Matthew Goodwin mm -hmm. uh, uh, and separately done by uh, UK and Changing Europe. Quite a lot of polling here, and those voters are essentially economically left wing. And you know, I think the terminology can be difficult here, whether you call them socially conservative or uh, author authoritarian or mm -hmm. nationalist. Um, but essentially, a, 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 a set of voters that could be described as sort of leaning right on those social issues. Uh, and, and I think if you are essentially a free marketeer, whether a small state one or not, but if you're a free marketeer, you, know, you have to accept that the, the government is going to be more interventionist. Uh, and if you take the view that, you know, as a country, we should essentially be you know, outward looking, engaged in the rest of the world, uh, wanting to bring down trade barriers, not put them up, um, you know, believers in free trade, and for all the government's rhetoric on this, you know, we are going to become a more closed economy post-Brexit, uh, that we are going to be putting up trade barriers, that there is a sort of real sense of wanting to you know, reshore things, bring things back into this country. Um, I think it is about putting up barriers, a more hostile attitude to quite a lot of the rest of the world. Um, and and that, is, that is not necessarily you know, what Boris Johnson entered politics to do, but I think that is the political logic of the, of, of the new geography mm. uh, British politics. And I think that that you know, going in that direction of a more nationalist, populist party 
is is where the votes are. I think that's how you retain the seats that the Conservatives won for the first time last December. And if their focus is, look, you know, we've got 50, 60 seats um, that are dependent upon this type of voter, you know, what do we do to keep our colleagues in Parliament and keep us in office? Is that you come forward with policies that will appeal to those voters whose instincts are not socially liberal and they're not free marketeers. Um, and you know, they're perfectly entitled to, to those, those, you know, those opinions, obviously. That's, you know, that, that, um, you know, that's, um, they're as entitled to their views as, 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 as I am or any free marketeer or social liberals, but it doesn't mean that the Conservative Party ceases to be that party. I think you know, we are seeing that realignment and the future for the short to medium term, it seems to me, for the Conservative Party um, is to focus more on retaining those votes than seeking to appeal to uh, younger, more socially liberal, um, or even you know, free marketeer voters. I don't think that's the you know, that's the market that they can succeed in. Mm. Uh, certainly not the market that that Boris Johnson can see, can, can succeed in, given all the baggage that he brings from the years of Brexit turmoil. So that's where I think the Conservative Party is going. I have to say, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I really hope that the, the party will kind of look again and reinvent itself as it has done in the past and says, you know, you know what, we need to appeal to you know, a, a, a younger set of voters. We need to make sure that we are winning the support of a good number of graduates, which is where Conservative support is collapsing um, and, and, and sort of represent the whole of the country and you know, some of the policies that might be pursued uh, to appeal to, to um, you know, working to man actually may be counterproductive and, and make this country less prosperous and more divided than it would otherwise be. I, I, hope, I hope my analysis is, it is wrong, but I, I think there is a really strong electoral case for the Conservative Party to go down the route that it's been going down uh, in recent years has delivered it a big majority and and might be it's i think probably is its best bet of retaining that majority at the next general election i just think it's a pity for the country of course uh, david Lillington argued that you are wrong and uh, that actually that there is still hope for a liberal conservative uh, foundation of the party um I, I wanted to ask you david also about your time in charge of the ministry of justice um you were, of course, Lord Chancellor, a Secretary of State for Justice under Theresa May. Uh, and since your departure, there have been discussions uh, about removing judicial review. Uh, Robert Buckland, very recently, I think this plan is, has, has been put on hold, uh, discussed the potential to remove trial by jury to get rid of a backlog of cases that have built up throughout the COVID-19 crisis. And before uh, her appointment as a Attorney General, uh, Suella Braverman said that uh, it's not just about taking back control from the EU, but also from the judiciary. Um, are you concerned about the government's stewardship of the justice system? Well, I think, first of all, in terms of um, the, the trial by jury idea, I, I wouldn't categorise it perhaps in the same way as the other points. I think, I think this was a, a desire to find a practical solution to very difficult circumstances. Um, particularly caused by COVID-19 and there were already challenges in truth within the court system but, but I think you know, the particular issues that have arisen because of COVID-19. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have to say I, I um, didn't like what was in the Conservative Party manifesto I and mean, it was pretty vague but the sort of you know, the, the old issue of looking at the the role of the courts in the way that they were intimating. I, I do hope that um, you know, we're not going to see a bit of a sort of war on um, the judiciary. Um, uh, it's one of the things I think would probably fit in with um, you know, the Conservative Party going in the direction of being a more populist party. So I hope we don't get there. I've got a lot of time for Robert Buckland, the uh, mm. Lord Chancellor. I think his instincts in these areas are, are very good. Uh, and I have confidence that you know, he, he would resist anything that would be um, you know, detrimental to the fabric of our, our, of our legal system. Mm. Um, but you know, I do think it is important that 
the ministers strongly defend the rule of law, the uh, independence of the judiciary. There are some ideas that are out there, uh, which I very much hope are on the sort of wilder fringes of this um, uh, area that, that don't come to fruition. Um, but you know, part of uh, you know, what makes the UK the country that it is, is, is our very long and strong tradition about the rule of law and the governments should tread very, very carefully before doing anything to undermine that. Uh, and I very much hope that they, they, they won't do so. Mm. Uh, and, and you were a part of a government uh, though that um, did make repeated cuts to legal aid uh, and uh, how much of a problem do you think that actually caused? Uh, did they go too far those cuts? What was your experience as uh, being in charge of the Ministry of Justice at that time? Well, we did make very difficult decisions um, over the course of the last 10 years in terms of the budget for legal aid. Uh, actually, the previous Labour government had also made some uh, reductions to legal aid, but it would be fair to say that the coalition government went on and did uh, much more. And there were parts of the system that were clearly under strain. Mm -hmm. And in my time in office, you know, we did a, a review uh, of legal aid and a number of recommendations were made. I don't think it's a question about reversing everything that's happened. I don't think it's about going back to uh, the system that existed uh, prior to 2010. But in terms of delivering access for justice, finding ways in which we can spend what will continue, I'm afraid, be a limited budget, mm -hmm. a constrained budget, but if we can find ways in which we can you know, ensure that um, we get better access to justice in some areas, you know, we are gonna need to be more generous. Uh, I think that is pretty clear in some areas. I think we need to look to see if there are new ways in which we can do things, um, and, you know, whether that is through use of technology, whether that is through law centres and so on. I don't think it's about, you know, as I say, putting us back in the position that we were 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, but you know, I, I accept that there are parts of the system that are under significant strain, mm -hmm. and some of that is going to require additional resources. Mm. Uh, and um, after you uh, stepped down, of course, as Lord Chancellor, you became a uh, backbench Conservative MP and then soon after um, an independent uh, MP. Uh, and you sought uh, re-election for Parliament as an independent MP, uh, along with the likes of Anne Milton uh, and Dominic Grieve. None of you were successful. Um, what do you think uh, that, uh, is there any prospect uh, for independent politics in British politics? I think Rory Stewart recently cited uh, that the phenomenal expense of running an independent mayoral campaign was one of the reasons why, uh, amongst other issues, he decided to withdraw. Um, can there ever be hope for independent politics? It's, it's very difficult um, as an independent. I mean, in many respects, I had lots of advantages um, uh, in terms of being you know, very much a sort of long-standing um, constituency MP, you know, committed to the area I'd lived in the constituency for um, 17, 18 years or so. Much of a campaign from other parties, either, although I did have Labour and Liberal Democrats standing uh, against me. Uh, and I still wasn't able to, to win. I got over 14,000 votes, but you know, wasn't able to win. I think there were particular factors in, in play. I mean, you know, the Conservatives got their uh, best result, I think, in nationally in terms of share of the vote mm. since 1970. But they got the you know the lowest result in Southwest Hertfordshire mm. uh, for for some years. Uh, but uh, the the national factors were very significant. People do vote for national parties. I think in this particular general election, the fear of Jeremy Corbyn in a constituency mm -hmm. like South West Hertfordshire was very, very strong. And I know speaking to others who were in a similar position, you know, those last few days, you were finding people who said, well, I'd rather vote for you. I don't think very much of Boris Johnson, or I don't think very much of where we're going on Brexit. 
but in the last few days, quite a few of those people said, yeah, but I just can't risk Jeremy Corbyn. And, yeah. and much though um, they certainly weren't going to get Jeremy Corbyn if they waited for me, um, that, that, that still played into it. And I think you know, that, that was a particular factor. But yes, our setup is, is not easy for independents. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you know, I knew that when I stood and it was always going to be an uphill challenge, but I felt I, I wanted to make my case. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I have no regrets about running as an independent. It was uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, I felt I wanted to, to to make my case, and I was pleased to be able to do so. I met some wonderful people in the campaign. Um, for what it's worth, I had a great time. Um, um, well, at least until they started counting the, the ballot boxes. Well, of course, it was a Conservative landslide, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn now uh, out of the way, still in Parliament as a backbencher, of course. Labour Party is under new management, uh, under Keir Starmer, um, and I believe an opinion poll last month actually placed Starmer ahead of Johnson as the country's preferred choice of Prime Minister. What have you made of Starmer's leadership so far, and do you think that uh, he and uh, the new uh, Labour Party have any prospects of getting into number 10? I think he's done pretty well. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a Labour supporter, but I think in terms of a sense of quiet competence. Um, uh, he's he's conveyed that. Uh, he's asked tough forensic questions in uh, Prime Minister Question Time and put the Prime Minister on the back foot. Uh, he's shown some toughness in terms of uh, dismissing Rebecca Long Bailey. Mm. Um, but I think there's still a long, you know, there's still a big task ahead of him. Um, you know, the Labour Party has still got to demonstrate some economic credibility. Uh, you know, we will see what his response is in terms of the inquiry into anti-Semitism. I'm pretty sure that uh, he will respond appropriately on, on that. But I think he does need to take on the, the hard left. Uh, and I think there will be a lot of voters that will ask themselves the question is how can a party that put up Jeremy Corbyn as a as a putative prime minister yeah. be trusted with government again. Um, yeah, how can how can a no way how can a party that still has Jeremy Corbyn as a member of parliament be considered to be uh, fit to run the country? And I think those you know those concerns will continue to persist. So there still remains a huge challenge for Keir Starmer. And although he's made significant progress, his personal ratings are very strong. The Labour Party's ratings are not that impressive, given mm. some of the difficulties the government has had to face. Uh, and given how difficult it will be to win seats in Scotland, for example, mm-hmm. route by which the Labour Party gets an overall majority at the next uh, election looks you know, perilously difficult for them. Uh, so, I, I, you yeah, know, one wouldn't underestimate the, the challenge in front of Keir Starmer, mm. but you know, does he come across mm. as a serious grown-up figure who one could imagine performing the role of Prime Minister appropriately? Uh, he does. Mm. I mean, and looking back at your own uh, political career uh, for a moment, um, what do you regard uh, in that time, both either as an MP or member of the government as your greatest political achievement and conversely as you'd expect I'd ask what do you regard as your greatest failure? Well I suppose um, I mean, the greatest failure is is um, the thing that I you know, tried to prevent from happening um, which is uh, a, a no-deal Brexit I think is quite likely to come to pass uh, and the sort of sense that the party of which I've been a member for 29 years um, is, is, is one that I think is you know, fundamentally transformed. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that's all my fault, but, um, but one has to look at that and say, well, that's, that's, a, that's a political failure of, of some, some significance. Uh, in terms of um, you know, successes and so on, uh, you know, sometimes, particularly as a, as a minister, there are things that you do that nobody ever particularly notices um, that, you know, years later um, play an important role. So if you want something sort of like really obscure, um, but when I came into the Treasury in 2010, I had a plan to try and reform our 
PAYE system, you know, the mm. administration mm. point. Uh, you couldn't get less glamorous than that. But, um, but I pushed HMRC to do that and introduced mm. something called real-time information mm. uh, into the tax system. Um, and uh, that happened. Uh, without that, I don't think it would have been possible to uh, introduced the furloughing scheme. Um, that wasn't, of course, in the forefront of my mind uh, when I did that, but that has actually you know, been something that's proved to be really important. Uh, mm. It doesn't mean that we are better able to cope with these circumstances because of a reform like that. Um, but I think look, more widely, I, was, I, I think I, 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 was, I did the right thing as the Justice Secretary to try to move the debate on to a greater focus on rehabilitation, to try to liberalise our criminal justice system. Mm. Um, I think I moved the debate on, but in terms of substance, uh, didn't achieve all that I would have liked to have done, but I did some good things there. And also, and credit to the government here and my successor, Robert Buckland, mm. uh, divorce law reform, uh, which is currently being legislated through, it's gone through the House of Commons, it'll go through the House of Lords shortly I assume, um, and that will bring our divorce system uh, up to date, substantially improve it, make the process less ghastly than it needs to be. Uh, and uh, that was something that I pushed for as, as just as secretary, and I'm, I'm pleased that that is going to come into effect. So um, I've cheated there and given you more successes than failures. <laughs> be. Fundamentally, I think the failures may be bigger than the successes. Well, you know, final question, I suppose, is that your career has, in some sense, gone full circle. You started, before your entry to Parliament in 2005, as a, you were a solicitor at McFarland uh, for six years, if I'm right. Uh, this is according to your Wikipedia profile, so hopefully that's up to date. Uh, and you've recently rejoined as the head of public policy. Uh, how has the transition been, moving back to the private sector? And uh, will there ever be a return to public life for you? Well, I think it's probably unlikely uh, that there'll be a return to public life uh, to me, but I probably already said too much in this interview to uh, ever enable that to happen. Uh, but look, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying my time back here at McFarland's. I mean, so far it's a little different. When I was at McFarland's before, people used to go to the office, whereas mm. now it just seems to be all working from home. But now I'm, I'm enjoying the work I'm, I'm doing. I'm advising clients on sort of some of the uh, some public policy issues that they're likely to face, what's going yeah. to happen in terms of Brexit and COVID and tax policy and so on. Um, it's proven to be intellectually stimulating. I'm enjoying meeting clients, uh, albeit uh, on Zoom calls and uh, so far so good. Only three months in, but um, mm. you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it and uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm still able to continue to uh, follow politics and government very closely. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, 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 I, I still I still enjoy that, uh, notwithstanding it's a sort of somewhat different position from the outside. Mm. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, David Gork. Thank you very much for speaking with me. Thank you, Nicholas. Great pleasure. Okay.